we need to have uh, actual scientific evidence to kind of determine what trembolone does anabolic wise and androgenic wise when compared to testosterone or compared to testosterone propionate or maybe even methyl testosterone. I collected all of the anabolic to androgenic ratings from the Anabolics 11th edition. I'll put them on the screen right now. It's an easy to understand list, including the reference standards that each anabolic androgenic steroid was compared to. I added in the alternative chemical names in case you're not really familiar with the name that is on the screen, as well as all of the commonly used uh, and known brand names and classified all of these steroids according to the administration route. So you don't have to. And as all of these ratings are scrolling on the screen, you see a common occurrence. The standard in many cases isn't just testosterone, it's also testosterone propionate, which has an ester, or it's methyl testosterone, which isn't really bioidentical to the testosterone you produce endogenously, and neither is it bioidentical to the testosterone that rats produce. And as I alluded to earlier, testosterone with an anabolic to androgenic rating of 100 each, is its own standard, right? Comparing testosterone endogenously to exogenous testosterone yields an anabolic to androgenic rating of 100 each. And then we have another outlier. Trimbolone, the reference standard, is nandrolone acetate, giving it an anabolic and androgenic rating of 500 each. But I thought trimbolone was five times more potent than testosterone. I thought that the reference standard for trimbolone was testosterone, not nandrolone acetate, which has an ester, more on that later, right? I'm a little bit confused and upset already. When you look at the oral anabolic androgenic steroids, so you see that in many cases, testosterone, testosterone propionate, or methyl testosterone are used as a reference standard. Going down further, and there's a lot of uh, data on the screen, so let's wait patiently while the scroll is going on. I will discuss some of these in depth later on in this video. For the sublingual or buccal anabolic androgenic steroids, we have methyl testosterone and testosterone. We have uh, transdermal anabolic androgenic steroids, clostable dihydrotestosterone and testosterone, subdermal anabolic androgenic uh, steroid implants in the form of trimbolone, but that's only in the context of cattle and testosterone testopil implants. We have ophthalmolytic anabolic androgenic steroids, basically eye drops in the form of nandrolone, and intranasal anabolic androgenic steroids in the form of testosterone, also known as Natesto. Now, as you guys saw, the reference standards for all of these anabolic androgenic steroids was either testosterone, testosterone propionate, methyl testosterone, and the sole outlier being nandrolone acetate being compared to trimbolone. Can we do some dubious extrapolation using math, not magnets, right? not magnets, we're going to use math to see how trimbolone compares to testosterone. First, I want to mention that um, Nandrolone acetate is an ester, but when you look at the anabolic androgenic rating of Phenajet, it's 500 to 500, which is uh, trembolone acetate. But Trendabol, trembolone inotate, also has an androgenic to anabolic rating of 500. And uh, Parabolin, trembolone hexahydrobenzocarbonate, also has an androgenic to anabolic rating of 500 each, all being compared to nandrolone acetate. So if we don't have to care about the ester, right? Acetate is irrelevant, the inotate is irrelevant, uh, hexahydrobenzoyl carbonate is irrelevant. Again, using some highly dubious and speculative math, comparing nandrolone to the reference standard of testosterone, extrapolating that using testosterone as the reference standard for trembolone, that would give trembolone an anabolic rating of 625 and an androgenic rating of 185. Interesting. Now, that isn't right, right? I mean, we can't use math to kind of calculate it that way. We need to have uh, actual scientific evidence to kind of determine what trembolone uh, does anabolic-wise and androgenic-wise when compared to testosterone or, you know, if that is not available compared to testosterone propionate or maybe even methyl testosterone. But I'm still highly curious where this anabolic to androgenic rating of trembolone compared to nandrolone acetate actually stems from. So I went through all the references of the Anabolics 11th edition. Every segment of Trembolone lists six citations. I went through all of them and didn't find anything about Trembolone being compared to nandrolone acetate. So please, let's put the community to work. If you can reproduce this Hirschberger bioassay comparing Trembolone to nandrolone acetate, post it down below. I'm very interested in reading it. I've done a lot of research. I found close to 10 other more recent Hersberger bioassays comparing uh, trembolone to testosterone propionate. And the anabolic and androgenic effects 
are quite different from what is being listed in the Anabolics 11th edition. The ones that I was able to find, the general consensus seems to be that Tremblone mostly has an anabolic effect on the levator ani muscle and less of an androgenic effect on the ventral prostate and seminal vesicles and a couple other organs, which are included in the highly updated, highly standardized version of the Hershberger bioassays, which were established in about 2011, but a lot more on that later. Don't worry, we'll go over all of it. So some of the authors also point out that the androgenic effects, uh, again, on the prostate tissue might be associated not just to the steroid that was being administered, but also testosterone, diodotestosterone, and indirectly estradiol. I mean, if you start looking at the prostate health and prostate cancer, it seems that all of these have some sort of contributory role. So the androgen receptor concentration, which might be increased from estrogens, also enhance androgen-mediated gene transcription, and these effects are predominantly noticeable in the prostate as well as in skeletal muscle, right? So a couple holes we are already starting to poke into these Hershberger bioassays. Now hold on before we start blowing our loads and point out exactly what's wrong with all of these Hershberger bioassays until they were standardized. All of the Hershberger bioassays, which were somewhat included in the Anabolics 11th edition, let's just briefly run down what the Hershberger bioassays are actually all about. Hershberger bioassays in rats or the Hershberger tests were first described in 1953 by L.G. Hershberger, E.G. Shipley, and R.K. Meyer at the Department of Zoology at the University of Wisconsin, and they were originally designed as a short-term in vivo screening to test or assess the anabolic or androgenic effects of steroids on the reproductive track. So in this original assay of 1953, which is already a modified version of previous assays, Non-mature pre-puberty rats were castrated to reduce endogenous testosterone production to as little as possible. Castrated rats were administered with various testosterone derivatives for eight consecutive days, after which they were killed and dissected to assess the size changes of the levator ani muscle and the ventral prostate and the seminal vesicle. So that's three org organs versus the five organs, which are included in the updated standardized version. Just keep in mind that this is very important to understand. Just because you castrate a rat doesn't mean that endogenous testosterone levels or dihydrotestosterone or estrogen levels bottom out. That takes several days. And just because you castrate a rat doesn't mean that the adrenal glands are no longer functioning. So you still get a pregnenolone production and DHA production, which ultimately converts into testosterone and then testosterone or estrogens. So you're never 100% bottomed out when you castrate a rat. And especially if you start uh, administering steroids from one day to the next, you have one day castration and the next day you start administering exogenous uh, testosterone derivatives. There is quite a bit of overlap regarding uh, the reproductive track. So many of these Hershberger, Hershberger bioassay results in the beginning is not just nandrolone or not just another testosterone derivative, it's testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, estrogens, and whatever else that they're administering exogenously. Now that aside, weight increases of the levator ani muscles was used to determine the anabolic effect of the steroid. This muscle was chosen because it lacks 5-alpha reductase enzyme activity, and the weight increases in the ventral prostate and seminal vesicles determine the androgenic effect. Now, even though the levator ani muscle doesn't contain 5 alpha reductase enzymes themselves, if you use a reference standard of testosterone, um, converting into testosterone or estrogens in peripheral tissue, doesn't matter if the levator ani muscle um, doesn't uh, have a 5 alpha reductase enzyme and thus the testosterone can't convert into testosterone locally, it can convert somewhere else, end up in the bloodstream, and then somehow activate or interact with the androgen receptors of the levator ani muscle, ventral prostate, or seminal vesicles, right? So I feel that the reference standard of these early Hershberger bioassays, uh, if the reference standard is testosterone, it's not just testosterone, it's testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, estrogens, and everything else that falls alongside of that as part of the sex hormone panel. Uh, weight changes in the kidneys, liver, brain, testes, and other organs were observed in many of these Hershberger bioassays, but not reported. Neither were changes in hair length, shedding of the hair, hair thickness, uh, gynecomastia tissue, etc. All the commonly associated side effects that we associate with androgenicity of steroids. All right, let's start um, discussing a little bit of what is mentioned in the early Hershberger bioassay. 
In this study, a modification of the Eisenberg and Gordon myotropic assay is proposed, which eliminates the 23-day post-castration rest period, which I think is very, very, very important to let testosterone, dieted testosterone and estrogen levels come down bottom out to basically zero, so you don't have an overlapping effect uh, for the animals and reduces total assay time from 31 days to only eight days. All right, so you castrate and you get busy. The advantages are, one, the rapid turnover of animals reduces the required size of the assay colony, and two, it becomes possible to start an assay at any time without a long post-castration delay. When you look at the updated versions, they reintroduce the post-castration delay. I think it's uh, seven to 10 days, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Further on, male rats of the Holtzman Rolfmeyer strain, 21 days of age, were castrated. Each animal was given daily a subcutaneous all injections of the test substances for seven days, beginning with the day of castration, right? So you castrate and you start injecting. On the eighth day, 22 to 26 hours after last injections, the animals were sacrificed and investigated. Now here we see uh, some of the early results, and it's very easy to see that the sample size of rats, actually quite small, maybe nine rats, six rats, four rats, and then various dosages, right? We have a very large sample size of the con castrated control rats, 25 rats, and then you see the baseline uh, body weight and the ventral prostate weight and seminal vesicle weight and electro ani weight, and then they start comparing testosterone propionate, testosterone, 19 nor testosterone, androlone, androsterone, esterone, estradiol dipropionate, progesterone, and a couple other sex hormones, which are part of this Hirschberger bioassay, the first one, at various sample sizes, various dosages, keeping track of the body weight changes and the changes in the sex organs. They use some fancy calculations to determine the levator ani to ventral prostate ratio, and that is the foundation for the anabolic or myotropic effects or the androgenic effects, which then lay the foundation for the anabolic to androgenic ratio, which is included in the anabolics 11th edition. Since this early Hirschberger bioassay of 1953, um, these were again modified and standardized and close to 700 potential androgens were investigated regarding their anabolic and androgenic effects on the levator ani muscle, ventral prostate, and seminal vesicles. Most of these assays were performed in the 1960s and early 70s, and then in 1976, the large majority of the Hirschberger bioassays, which proved that particular compounds, testosterone derivatives, had anabolic and androgenic effects and properties, 